Okay, so you're being recorded right now. I'm ready whenever you are, Geert. Good. Then the, there we go for that. We are uh, on this moment at half of the people that we get that uh, registered, uh, but while we are talking, I suppose more people will come come in. Um, there's a good afternoon again. I'm Geert uh, Vermeer. Uh, together with Rich, I would like to take you on a trajectory, um, the OICA into the atmosphere um, project. Uh, I am um, a curator and a an writer. Uh, I am um, co-founder of a collective a group that is called um, the Milena Principle. Uh, we are bringing together uh, scientists, artists, uh, uh, environmentalists, and um, um, in the idea of meeting and working together, but in the first place to immerse ourselves, to be together in nature and start from there. And uh, uh, Rich will introduce you in uh, the OICA uh, project, uh, also taking you on a voyage uh, through uh, uh, deep history, deep science. Uh, Rich, uh, speciality and expertise is uh, the deep uh, side of history and science um, as an environmental uh, scientist. And I will ac accompany you for the ones that uh, desire uh, so. Um, after a four week um, deepening course that will follow on this uh, info call and the, the one last week. Um, so people that feel uh, like joining a course of four weeks um, uh, after this call uh, can um, uh, candidate themselves for that. And uh, this course will eventually lead to a creative artistic process that I as a curator uh, will elaborate with you during a three, six months uh, period, together with which working on works of art uh, that um, involve ecological intelligence and leading to an exhibition um, on the end of, the, uh, of that period. Um, I will um, uh, give the word now to Rich, who will uh, explain you much more about what is waiting for us on this voyage. <laughs> Thank you, Geert. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Rich Blundell. I originally started as a commercial fisherman, <laughs> of all things. Eventually found my way into geology, the study of geology, then worked my way through the history and philosophy of science, and eventually uh, came to specialize in the story of everything. So my, uh, my dissertation research was all about uh, cosmic evolution and how humans fit into that story. So in some sense, I guess I'm, I'm a cosmic ecologist. Um, but anyway, we can get into that a little more. So I'm here to introduce to you uh, this project called Into the Artmosphere uh, through a organization I started called OICA. And so I'm here to tell you about that. And, and then after this, um, we can get into more details about how we can collaborate. So we'll invite you to collaborate on the project. So where to begin? Let's see. Well, like I was saying, I just finished up a dissertation. So this is a PhD that I did. It took me about five years. And in this project, uh, it's called Waking Up in the Anthropocene, Big History and the Biosphere. But in this project, I was strongly encouraged by my supervisor and the entire academic community to document my sources. And so what you see here are uh, just pages and pages and pages of references that I cite in my dissertation. It goes on and on and on. So I'm very proud of this, of course, and it's the kind of thing any upstart academic, re it's the most important part of any sort of early career academic pursuit is to make sure that you cite your sources. Mm -hmm. So then as I was finishing up, um, well, through the course of this whole dissertation, I have to say, um, I developed, oh, and the reason I'm telling this story is because this is a tree festival. And so this sort of cropped up as an opportunity to really talk about the role that trees played in my research. So throughout this dissertation process, every day I would 
it was a very complicated dissertation. So every day I would have these long cognitive, vicious sort of like just running, running, running. How am I going to solve this problem or that problem? The research design, the data analysis, some methodological concern, or how am I going to, you know, increase rigor and do the qualitative analysis and all this other stuff. So I would, I would get into this routine where I'd be thinking about all these problems and it would just race through my mind all the time. And I developed the practice of uh, going for a hike uh, up into the mountains near where I lived. And I would do it every day. And so I'd, I'd arrive at the trailhead down at the bottom, my mind totally full of all these questions racing through my head. And I would set off on the trail and I'd want to get up. It's about an hour, hour and a half hike. I'd want to get up to the top of the hill. And as I'm hiking, you know, the, the blood's starting to flow. My heart rate's going up. I'm breathing. And I'm thinking, 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 passing all these trees on the way up. And I would keep hiking and hiking. And I would do it through the season. So this is a shot of the trail in the, in the wintertime. And even some of like, I would pass these big old stumps, which are these sort of old sources. Uh, and then I would get to the top eventually. I would eventually get to the top, take a break, drink some water, pull out an apple, relax. And by the time I finished my apple, I realized that all those things that I had, thinking, that I had been thinking about, struggling with, were gone. Like my mind was clear and I felt really calm and at ease and just really good. And so then, as if that's not enough, as I would start back down the trail, this is how I experienced it. I'd be walking past this one particular set of trees, this, this little corridor that you see here. And all of a sudden it felt like something would tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, here's the answer to that question that you had asked on the way up. And so I got this distinct impression that the trees had been listening as I was racing through all this stuff in my mind. I'd go up the trail, I'd get up there, I'd wait for a while, turn around, come back. And by the time I got back, the tree had sorted it out for me. And so there's this corridor of really wise trees that it feels to me like they were, they were critical to my research. But here's the documentation of all of the knowledge sources, but nowhere in the dissertation was I allowed. In fact, I asked and I was told I couldn't do it. Nowhere was I allowed to actually cite or even tell the story about the trees. I understand why, and this is good, you know, this is scholarly academic work. So you really can't be talking about how trees are talking to you in your work, but they did give me one place to do it. And that was in the dedication page. So that's where I put this, uh, expression of my gratitude. So it says to the bluefin tuna of Stellwagen Bank, which is a different story. But if you're interested in that story, you can uh, check out oika.com. There's a video that tells that story. But and to the oak trees of Red Hill. So I did get a chance to cite the real sources. And guess what? The feeling associated with the sense of gratitude for the trees is much different for the gratitude I have for the for the books that that I got the knowledge from. Anyway, so that's my that's my shout out to the trees in my dissertation. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about um, uh, this project called Oika Arts into the Artmosphere. But before I do that, I want to tell a, a quick story. Because Oika is about transformation. And I want to tell the story of this guy. So this picture was taken in about 1911. This was a guy who was hired by the US Forest Service to go out and prepare the lands out in Arizona and New Mexico for ranchers that were going to come out and start settling the area. And so in his sort of, the, in, the, in the logic of his day, the idea was if you are going to have grazing animals, the best thing you can do is to remove the predators from that land. So that was his job. And we know this because he, he wrote it, he, he tells the story in his journal. He writes, we were eating lunch on a high rim rock at the foot of which a turbulent river elbowed its way. We saw, so he's sitting up above a river. We saw what we thought was a doe fording the torrent, her breast awash in white water. When she climbed the bank and shook out her tail, we realized our error. It was a wolf. 
A half a dozen pups sprang from the willows and all joined in a welcoming melee of wagging tails. It was literally a pile of playful wolves. In those days, we had never heard of passing up a chance to kill a wolf. In a second, we were pumping lead into the pack. When our rifles were empty, the old wolf was down and a pup was dragging a leg into impassable slide rocks. So this is um, just sort of an example of how, you know, the, the culture of the East Coast of Massachusetts and all the game management, uh, resource management ideas of the time were imported into the West. And, this, and what eventually happened was they removed all the predators, all the wolves, they came in, they had a few good years of ranching, but then there was, you know, ecological collapse. You know, it was overgrazed and it turned out to be this major catastrophe. Um, and so, yeah, so this is the result of that kind of thinking imported into that landscape, into that ecosystem. Extinction of, well, not extinction, but extermination of wolves, near extinction of wolves. That, of course, is a story of separation, a separation of between what they believed and the reality, the ecological reality on the ground. There was a separation between those two things. And, and, and the extension of that story of separation we experience today. So here are some graphs that scientists have, you know, collected the data for. These are the earth system trends. You can see things like nitrous oxide, coastal nitrogen, uh, domesticated land use, uh, marine fish capture. So these are things that can be quantified. In other words, qu counted by scientists to describe what's going on in the world. Okay. And then in this, these graphs, these are a little more um, uh, broadly um, conceptualized. These are socioeconomic trends. So here they're not just measuring sort of quantitative things in the environment, but these are things that are sort of on, on the edge of the human world as well. Things like uh, gross domestic product, fertilizer consumption. But all again, these are quantitative entities that describe the Anthropocene. But they figured that this isn't really good enough. It doesn't really capture it in a compelling way for the average person to kind of grasp. These are the hockey stick diagrams of exponential use. That doesn't quite work for the general public. So they came up with this. This is the planetary boundary survey. And I'm not, I'm not sort of dissing this and the research and the people behind it, but I'm saying this is the best depiction using the best data from some of the world's best scientists to describe the Anthropocene without getting into what it, you know, what it means. What it's showing is how those quantitative values in different ecosystems around the planet are exceeding their capacity to, to, to restore themselves, to regenerate. It's called the planetary boundaries framework. So the idea here is that these, these are boundaries that we shouldn't cross. Um, okay, but so, so this is it. I mean, this is the Anthropocene here, but what, what this fails to capture really, just like, just like this, the, the references in my dissertation fail to capture the feeling of the lived experience in the world. This is more of what the Anthropocene feels like. And it's not just environmental destruction like you see here, it's also social disruption, economic disparity, things like xenophobia and um, that, that fall well out of the realm of environmental science, political uh, absurdities. Like, there's no way for a scientist to measure what, what's going on because these are, these are elements of some other realm that science doesn't, doesn't deal with. It can't approach. And so that's why this diagram absolutely misses the lived experience of the Anthropocene. To look at this, you'd think, oh, we just need to tweak this here and tweak that there and this ecosystem and we can get these values back down and the problem is solved. But here's the thing. So it's called the Anthropocene and this is the, you know, the Anthropocene framework. But where in this diagram is the Anthropos even represented? It's not even there. These are just, these are just symptoms. These aren't the problem. 
the central problem of the Anthropocene is the Anthropos, and it's not even depicted on the best diagram by the best scientists that we could come up with. So this is sort of the impetus for why I'm reaching out to artists. We can do better than this. We have to do better than this. And it's also the basis of this organization called Oika. So what is Zoika? I think the first thing I can do is just tell you where that word comes from. The word Oika is a play on the word Oikos, which some of you may know is an ancient Greek word, which referred to person, place, and property. So this was the, you know, the Greeks conception of home, basically. And in this, the person was the man of the house. I mean, remember, this is a patriarchal society. So it's, in this case, the person is the man. The place is the actual physical house. And the property is the stuff in the house. That includes the wife, the kids, the furniture, the slaves. And so <clears throat> clearly this isn't quite going to work uh, for me. So what I did was I just took the word oiko and feminized it. Um, to oika. So, oh, I just wanted to point out also before moving on that eco, as in ecology and economy, come from that word oiko. So oiko is the root of those two things. And, and this is critical because one of oika's sort of proposals or um, assertions is that we need to re rejoin these two ideas. Right now, ecology and economy, even though they share that same root, they are completely different in their sort of agendas, motivations, intentions, and things like that. And so Oika is really about bringing those two things back into a more dovetailed um, conception as they originally thought. So by putting that A in the end, by feminizing it, which doesn't mean necessarily that it's a female thing, it just means that it's got uh, feminine uh, sensibilities, which are more inclusive and expansive. Just how expansive, I'm gonna, I'm going to share with you in a minute. Um, but so in the Oika conception, person in this case refers to uh, the actual person, the being. It's gender nonspecific. It could even be species nonspecific. But Oika means person. Place in this case, instead of just being the house, means the ecosystem, the habitat the watershed, the valley, the village, the neighborhood, that kind of thing. And pers the idea here is that we combine or we draw links between person and place through the next P, practice. So instead of property, it's now practice. So what are those things that we can do to almost ritualize that, that strengthen the bond between person and place? And the last one is uh, prosper. And so that, this is getting back to that idea that we need to somehow unify ecological concerns and economic concerns. This is not just about painting the you know, economic as the problem or as you know, evil. It's really about just shifting our fundamental conceptions about how these two egos are actually one. And so, um, the way we're doing this now is primarily through an online course. Um, and this is just a screenshot of, of one, of the, one of the ways that we do this. I'm not sure if you can see me. Um, can you actually see me, uh, Geert? Am I visible? Because I was going to show you something. Okay. Uh, we, also do, we also use an app, a really nice app. Uh, it's called the Trello board. And so you can see all the things that are on the, the screen are actually available through an app. So we use this app. And one of the most important parts of this course is, uh, so you can see we work our way through all those different modules, but are these concepts. Um, see that's, yeah, so you see on here, there's uh, these little concepts. In the first instance of an OICA course, which is that one month one, we walk, uh, we, we walk you through three core concepts of narrative, emergence, and fractals. And then there's other optional ones that you can do also as we go along. But this is the basic delivery 
mechanism for the one month course that we're talking about uh, called Into the Artmosphere. Um, uh, these are just some screen grabs of some of the stuff that we're doing. So the idea here is that um, we're building a community of artists and storytellers and media members to create art that manifests ecological intelligence. So, and in ecological intelligence, not only through their work, but in culture and in doing so that will realign nature and culture. That's the core sort of um, intention of, of, of OICA. So, so what is this ecological intelligence? Because it's, it's, it's really the basis of all of this work. Usually in a course, I'll ask that question, what is ecological intelligence? And I'll get one or two answers. The first answer is that, the first explanation is that ecological intelligence is out there. This morning I've been watching, there's a little frog pond out here, and I've just been watching the frogs. I've actually been looking at them with my binoculars. And I've been just, I've never, there's, I'm watching things because, you know, I'm here a lot. And so I'm seeing things that I've never seen before about how frogs interact with each other and how they respond to like, if, if a bird of prey will go over a hawk or something, they'll, they'll respond or if a cat goes through. And also there's this, there's all this jostling that's going on on the shore. And when I watch that, it, it, it's, that's one way that people think of ecological intelligence, that it's out there, that those creatures are all participating in their kind of life story. And, and just by doing so, just by getting by and being what they are, they're participating in a kind of intelligence that's distributed throughout that whole ecosystem. So that's one answer that I get, that ecological intelligence is out there in the trees and in the atmosphere and in the water and in the animals. The other answer I get is that it's in here. That when, so when we decide to like recycle or drive less or buy a more fuel efficient car, we're exercising ecological intelligence. We're being good ecological stewards when we do that. And so those are the kind of two primary answers I get. But what those two answers are really revealing is that ecological intelligence is both out there and in here. It's the same intelligence, actually. That's the big insight here is that there is no separation between what intelligence is out there in the natural world and in us. It's just that we need to bring them back together into, to unify them, reunify them. Um, another big idea of uh, OICA is that continuity is real. So this is, uh, I studied big history, which is sort of the academic version of, of um, deep time. And uh, this is from a physicist, uh, astrophysicist at uh, Harvard University, and he writes, I'm talking about what continuity means. If we are to articulate a unified worldview for all complex systems observed throughout nature, then we must objectively and consistently model each of them identically. To restate once more for clarifying emphasis, complex systems slightly differ fundamentally not in kind but only in degree. That is degree of complexity manifesting ontological continuity. So he did that to clarify. I'm not sure he did. But he also did it to emphasize, okay, that's important because, you know, scientists, especially astrophysicists at Harvard, don't usually put that in their academic work that they're going to restate for clarifying emphasis. I'm not sure he clarified. But what he's emphasizing here is that everything is continuous and that if we're going to understand the world, we have to take that as a, as a fundamental principle that everything is continuous. There's a continuity between all things. That's what ontological continuity means to an academic. So the way we do this in OICA, the way we kind of feel ontological continuity is by telling a story, a big story, a story of continuity, the story of the universe. As we, now, I'm going to try and do this really quickly. This is the kind of thing that we would dive into in the course, you know, devote plenty of time to it. But right now, it's a 13.8 billion year story and I'm going to try and do it in less than 10 minutes. So we're going to move quickly through it. But so of course we know the big bang start, uh, we, the universe starts with the big bang. Actually it doesn't. It, 
we don't really know what what came before the Big Bang. So there is a mystery there that I want to acknowledge that we don't know everything. And the story told by big history, or at least in Oika, does not claim to know everything. It just claims to know what we know scientifically, but it's not, it's all provisional because that mystery still infuses the whole story. I just want to acknowledge that. So then about 380, so you have to realize that the early universe was a very hot, dense, chaotic plasma of energy where light and matter and energy are all essentially the same thing. That's what a plasma is. But if given enough time, given a little bit of time, that starts to cool and spread out a little bit. So 380,000 years after the Big Bang, which is like a less than a blink in cosmic time, the universe cooled enough so that the first discrete forms of light could exist without immediately self-annihilating. These are photons. So this is a shot of the early universe taken with a satellite that we send up into orbit. Here, I have a shot here. So this is the, you can see the little satellite on the right there, looking back out into space, back in time as it does. And eventually there's a little blue disk that you can see there on the left. That's that image of the cosmic background radiation. Um, that the that this so this satellite sees in the microwave doesn't see visible light but what it reveals in this image that it took is that the first visible light this is called the surface of last scattering so the first discrete photons of light once they formed they could shoot off in all directions and suddenly space went black and transparent but if you could see it in the microwave as we do today you'd see these little splotches of color. Those represent the differences in temperature and energy in the light that's the residue of the Big Bang. So that's why they sometimes call this the, the echo of the Big Bang. But what's interesting about this, it's not perfectly uniform. In other words, there's different temperatures and because of those different temperatures, there's an opportunity for energy and information to be exchanged between those two points. If they had been completely uniform, no exchange would have been possible. No relationship would have been possible. No, no, ecolo no ecology would have been possible. Remember, ecology is the, is the study of relationships. This image shows that written right into the blueprint of the universe are ecological dynamics. If it had been uniform, no relationships, no ecology. This is an ecology of light. It's an ecology of the primordial light of the universe. And this evolves into everything that we see around us today. So if you just take a quick look around your room, all the matter and the stuff that you see evolved from this. So everything, this microphone has a lineage all the way back to this light. That's continuity, by the way. So in the background of all that, all that energy and light comes together to form the first structure of the universe, the mega scale structure of the universe. Actually, that is the wrong slide. I'm sorry. That is the brain scan of a rat. Ah, there it is. Okay, so that is actually an artist's conception of the mega scale structure of the universe. This then evolves into uh, star. So just like photons are discrete units of light, stars are discrete units primarily of hydrogen and helium that come together under the forces of gravity. And, and what pops out of that, it, once enough gravity coheres, you get a nuclear furnace that begins. And stars create energy by compressing hydrogen and helium into more and more atomic elemental structures. So these are stars that are churning out, but will later become the elements that we live in and among and of today. So the calcium in our bones was forged in stars like these. Um, this is what being a star stuff means. And so, so this is the story of stars. Now we have an ecology, not just of light, 
but of stellar bodies, which is a higher form, a sort of more complex ecology. Well, some of these stars, just like the early energy of the universe formed um, structure, so do stars in the form of like, in some cases, these spiral galaxies. So this new structure emerges. That word emergence matters. That's why we dive deep into it in Oika. So these new beautiful structures emerge. And in some of those, um, in some of those constellations and galaxies, stars of a certain magnitude burn through their, they don't burn it, but they fuse through their, their uh, fuels quickly and go supernova. And when they do, they take all of that elemental raw materials that they've been creating and spread it further out into the universe and spread it out across space. So in some, in some of these post nebula areas, new planets will form. Or, or, or new stars. So secondary stars will again come together, ignite. They have a gravitational field. There's all kinds of rubble left over from the supernova. And we think about 5 billion years ago, there was a supernova in our sort of vicinity of, the, of space. That was the basis for the solar system as we know it. You can see here a representation of the accretionary disk of our solar system, lots of rocks getting swept out in orbits around the central star, which is the sun. And on one of these planets, you know, the third one away from the star, you get these rocky congregations. But if you look down in there, this is the earth or a representation of the earth. There's no life down there. They're inhospitable to life, um, but it happens. Now, we don't know exactly how life started on earth, but what's, what's I think more important about than knowing how it happened, we know that it happened and we actually have several plausible explanations as to how it happened. The one I like the most right now and the one that makes the most sense is one where there's a, a, a cooperation between um, cycles of, of, of drying and, and wetting and heat and, and that organic molecules got into an association with crystal lattices and then those crystal lattices imprinted their structure onto the organic molecules. And you've also got membrane things happening and suddenly you've got something that looks like a protocell. And anyway, life happens. We know that it's here. So I'm just gonna skip ahead here. We've got life now on that previous lifeless planet. And I don't know if this, if you see it here, but just like in the cosmic background radiation or that shot of the first stars, those were all ecologies. This is an ecology. So this is an ecology of life on earth. This is, the, this is a biological ecology. And so what we're seeing here are trilobites, you know, just sort of grazing around on a crinoid seafloor. And if, if, we, if we just sort of take a moment to tell the story of these trilobites, if we look at them, they start relatively simple with this repetitive pattern, almost like there's symmetries across scale, which is what is the definition of a fractal. And we see as over time, they kind of get more and more complex as they evolve. So they're in this relationship now with different environments on the seafloor, and they get more and more beautiful. And you start to see new structures appear like, on this one, you can just kind of see these little calcite eyes, um, which don't see very well. So, and they get more and more complex and ornate. I don't know, maybe this is trilobite art, who knows? But, but it just so happens that on the other side of the planet, which is still quite molten and tectonically active, there are these volcanic eruptions that create environmental conditions that snuff out the trilobites. So they're gone. We don't have trilobites anymore. But their extinction creates the opportunity for a new species. In this case, it's more of a reptilian thing with this more advanced brain. And it's, it, you see it immediately sort of radiate out into new habitats on the earth. It diversifies. So we see just like in the trilobites, we see this, this 
proliferation of different kinds of dinosaurs. And, you know, if you had dropped yourself, if you had been dropped on this planet back in the Cretaceous, the beginning of the Cretaceous, you would see all these dinosaurs and think this is a, this is a planet of, of reptiles. Well, remember the early Earth out there, there was all those meteorites around. Well, one of those meteorites, which had gone on a long orbit, comes back around about 65 million years ago, impacts the planet. That's it for the dinosaurs. So they're gone. The point is, in both of those cases, whatever those creatures were doing, it wasn't the right thing. And now they're gone. So being around for a long time, and their tenure on the planet was much longer than ours by millions and millions of years, just being here for a long time and being ubiquitous is no guarantee that you're going to survive if you're not doing what you need to be doing to survive long term. But the dinosaur's extinction raises yet another opportunity for another upstart species. In this case, it's a little furry shrew that had been living in the shadow of the dinosaurs, and it evolved into this primate-like creature. And I like this shot because it shows in the background there's a volcano which is spewing out, you know, the rocks and the ejecta of the earth out into the plains of Africa. And I like to imagine that one of these little Australopithecines, an early hominid, uh, picked up these rocks. Maybe the, this is Lucy. Maybe she picked up one of these rocks. She's one of these brainy primates, by the way. And in it, she saw a use. So in her mind, she was able to pick up this rock and imagine that it, if she did certain thing to it, it would have a consequence and then she could use that thing. What she's really doing there is processing the world that she's encountering in a narrative way. This is the emergence of story in the universe that we see in these rocks. Again, this is my, this is my sort of interpretation, but it works. So this is the emergence of story in the universe. So this is 2.6 million years ago. Homo habilis, handyman, creates these beautiful old one tools. But now have a look at this one. Did you feel that? Could you feel the difference between that and that? That's a feeling. Like, I felt it. When I saw it, I was like, ooh, this is little spark of delight that happens, even though it's... Cause, and the thing that you need to know here is that this tool does not need to be this symmetrical. In fact, it's more symmetrical than it needs to be. There's a cutting edge that goes all the way around it. It's actually probably harder to use as a tool because it's symmetrical. So whoever made this prioritized something else, beauty. This is the emergence of aesthetic in the universe or the emergence, this could be the emergence of art. So we can see it recorded in the stones. And it only took a million years for that primate to do it. This one here is called, uh, this is a, a, called, um, uh, it's a different technique. It doesn't look all that great now, but if you think about what's going on here, you've got a hominid who, who, who's getting good at creating stone tools and chipping flint. And in this, this is, these are Neanderthal tools. What it's doing here, I'll just see if I can say this quickly. It's taking a, a stone and, and hitting another stone and archaeologists and anthropologists can actually sequence these chips. So they know you can actually trace the thinking of the, of the, of the organism that did this. They're, they're creating a shape on the rock. And then with a final blow, they hit it and then they get the tool. It's not all the little chips they want. They're creating a surface on the rock, hitting it with a final blow, and then that becomes the tool. So the, the thought process, and I've tried this so it makes sense. The logic there is that you're seeing one thing in terms of another. Seeing one thing in terms of another. That is the emergence of metaphor in the universe. So we're actually seeing it here again. So these hominids are onto something. They're not just making, you know, pretty shells or getting big and ferocious. They're doing something of a second order, of a higher order of thinking that, that no other species has done that we know of. So think about this. You've got these hominids down in Africa, and they are uh, they're, you know, living primarily in the trees. They've got these qualities, and they set out across the whole landscape of Earth. This is the human diaspora out of Africa. 
in doing so, they've got to cross every habitat that the earth has to offer. The, the forested landscapes, the savannas, they go along rivers, across deserts, through estuaries, they skirt glaciers. They, they experience over generations and generations every habitat that the earth has to offer. And in each case, they're, they're getting to know it intimately. They're learning from it. The earth is teaching hominids how to be earthlings, okay? So if you take this scenario, you've got this animal that has the capacity for storytelling and aesthetics and metaphor, and you set out across and get every habitat of the planet, and you experience something like this in the world, becomes this. So what we're seeing here is like early humans using this unique capacity for seeing themselves in the world and the world in them and using it to create art. It's like, it's like the primordial function of art, okay? And it's ours, it's humans doing this. And so, this is 30,000 years. So, and so you get situations like this where an organism encounters a scene like this and creates something like this. You know, and this is exquisite because it's capturing like nuances that we miss now today. Whoever carved this had an intimacy with this, with this ecosystem. This animal, you know, we butchered. We, you know, in order to get the internal structures right you've got to know these animals intimately and so art was uniquely tied to our survival as a species as well i don't know it just seems like art has a higher calling than we currently ask of it and this is what oika is trying to get to so if you, I'm gonna just skip ahead here because I know I'm running out of time, but if you take that same principle and this capacity for making art and expressing the, the ephemeral, not the ephemeral, the ineffable, and, and, and uh, make it real in the world, you get modern societies from that. Um, so what I've basically just told you is, is a natural history of art. And what's, what's, what's interesting is that it shows a kind of, remember this story started in the physics of the Big Bang and it worked through the chemistry of stars and the, the biology of trilobites. And now it's about art. There is no break. There is no categorical break anywhere in that line. It's ontologically continuous. And so we end up with, this is Shakespeare in the cave. I just throw him in there because he's cute. So <clears throat> that's, a very quick overview of the story of the universe as we tell it in Oika. And if, we take the, if you take the course, we go deep into that in different chapters. So I wanna just tell the story of this guy now. Uh, this, you may know, is uh, Aldo Leopold. He was one of the uh, great American conservationists. He's responsible for um, uh, arguing for the, the establishment of, of, of vast national parks out in the American uh, West. Uh, in particular, he was active in the establishment of, um, so here he is, I got a little picture of him looking out over the Gila wilderness. Um, he was very instrumental in getting the, um, so this is called the Aldo Leopold wilderness, of getting wolves reintroduced to these habitats that they had been exterminated uh, from 100 years ago. Um, and so you'll see that there's all these really cool wolf introduction, reintroduction programs happening in these areas where they had been exterminated by this guy. But here's the thing. This guy is this guy. Same guy. This is Aldo Leopold back in 1911 when he first took his job. And that's Aldo Leopold um, as, as, you know, as, a, as an American conservationist. So we know, I just want to get back to that day on the edge of the river when they shot the, the wolf, when our rifles were empty, the old wolf was down. 
and the pup was dragging a leg into impassable slide rocks. I'm gonna pick it up from there. He continues, we reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then and have known ever since that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and the mountain. I was young then and full of trigger itch, but after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. You can read this story. Uh, it's, it's, uh, he tells it in an essay called Thinking Like a Mountain. It's in the book, uh, the uh, uh, Sand County Al Almanac by Aldo Leopold. This is the kind of transformation that Oika is all about. And it's not just, I mean, what we're seeing here is that Leopold went through a personal transformation. He spent time in those environments and they worked on him. They slowly changed his mind, just like the trees that I walked past slowly kind of changed me. Habit, spending time in a place like, like that will change you. And if it changes you on a personal level, it can change us collectively on a cultural level. That's the sort of mode by which Oika operates is that we can transform our inner narratives and our inner landscapes and then that gets projected out onto the natural landscape uh, through culture so sorry i've already been through that so i think what we can say is what happened to leopold was this process of oika so that pretty much sums up the presentation part i wanted to leave plenty of time for talking about the project. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, how do we want to do this, uh, uh, Geert? I, um, yeah, yeah, thank you, Rich. I propose that, that we open the floor for some questions uh, first. Yeah. Okay. I see a chat window here. I can open up that. Okay. I think it's a good idea. Uh, do you want to unmute mute everyone, or do you want to um, do you want to just ask them to uh, 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 write things in the chat or wave at you? What's uh... okay? I, well, there is a question here by Estella. Uh, how broad is the definition of art? Does it stretch to poetry too? Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. it, I, you know, I I really. But by the way, I need to emphasize. You know, I'm not a refined artist in any way. I'm I'm, I'm an ecologist. I, I don't know how to critique art, you know, for its aesthetic value or it's all the things you learn in art school about how to do art. I, I have absolutely no, no authority to, to judge anybody's work on, the, on, the, on those um, grounds. However, I do have a sense of what ecological intelligence means. And I know it when I see it. I know it when I hear it. And so... Um, if, if you participate in this, what you can expect from me is, is a critique on that and, and, and help in developing that voice. A big part of what Oika is, 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 is helping artists communicate their inner process and, and, and especially communicating the value of their own work. So that's what I strive to do is to get artists to be able to articulate those things. And in any case, when I hear it, I'll advocate for it. If, 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 we, if we work together and collaborate and we, and we know each other and I get to know your work and I see ecological intelligence in it, I'll do everything in my power to champion it. And so, um, yeah, that's getting a little off the point of the question, but of course, poetry uh, is art. Uh, um, and it's especially art because it's, 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 it's fundamentally com communicative in its, its uh, uh, delivery. So, yes. I, I was, sorry, I was asking that, Rich. Um, hi. hi. Um, sorry, I've not got my video on. I've been eating some food and I didn't want everyone to watch me. But I met an amazing slam poet last Sunday virtually in a virtual event. But their day job is as a climate change scientist at Imperial College London. But I was asking them about their poetry and they kind of specialize in scientifically accurate but 
but comical poetry and they've written kind of poems about whether we should be eating insects and they they, they and I, and as I've been in this presentation I was thinking oh I wish I'd told Robin about this I think he might be so so after this talk I'm just going to forward details of, of, of what you do to Robin they might not be interested at all but as I was listening to your presentation I had a few little kind of connections going off in my brain about a conversation that I'd had with them last Sunday. That's great. I, I, I should probably though should at this point try to emphasize for, for clarifying, restate for clarifying emphasis that uh, Oika is not about getting artists to, to, to portray the work of scientists. That's not what this is. It's not about enlisting artists to make science pretty and accessible. That, that's, a, that's an honorable thing to do, but that's not what Oika is about. What Oika is about is getting artists to get us to feel the reality that science has, has, has shown us. Science has revealed nothing less than magic. And, it, and, and this is an attempt to get artists really, you know, to tap into their creative talents by 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 going into an alliance with nature and i'm sure artists already do this i know that artists my working assumption is that artists have this deeply um finely tuned sensibility and awareness and intimacy with nature that's what artists do you know and so i get that what i'm just saying is like we've got and this is what my research, my research was about, was there are concepts and language in, in the scientific narrative uh, that artists can use to, to um, cultivate in the rest of us this sense of belonging to the world. <laughs> That's a different task than doing scientifically accurate sketches and things like that. So as Again, as honorable and noble that is as a pursuit, that's not quite what I'm asking people to do. I'm asking them to have the kind of transformation that Leopold had and then produce work with courage and confidence to change culture because that's the only way we're going to get out of this mess, uh, I think, is that kind of uh, courage and energy. And it, and it has to be economically viable. I get that. And so... A big part of uh, the OICA curriculum, in fact, the whole PROSPER module of the OICA curriculum is devoted to exploring how artists can make a living, a viable living doing this. So again, sorry, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent there, but these are just things that I was hoping to get out. Yes, yeah, so Charlotte, you can put on your mic. No? Yes, thank you so much for this presentation. I was really touched when I was uh, informed about early human artworks and mm. make me realize that the very gift we were given as humans was to create beautiful mm. things out of our observation and connection with nature. I have a question here which is related to um, OIKA, the artist community, which I read last week on the website. And it was mentioned that art is today um, about to take a role of healing, um, healing the humans, our relationships, but also the planet. I, I will quote what was written on the website that this calling art as mar a modern oika art as modern shamanism. Um, could you expand a little bit on that? And also me myself has been an artist but I've never gone to art school. I studied physics and design. Um, science has always been my pursuit of um, truth and beauty. Um, I decided to study science instead of art in school. Um, and, but now um, I've been pursuing my, my artist career a little bit starting on that it's very very early stage and i i really i really resonate what you said um, about art 
being this vehicle of connection, a sensible connection with nature. And I have been very interested in creating a mystical narrative around science, scientific knowledge, um, science teaching. And that's why I've been interested in what you said about modern shamanism, because I think my artist side has this connection with nature. I'm also very much occupied by the scientific language in my head. Um, mm. be interesting to see how you, how you um, bridge these two. Mm. Well, I mean, I mean it about shamanism. Um, shamanism, I think, fundamentally is about healing. You know, I mean, the, the shaman traditionally was the one of the village who people would go to for, you know, to resolve problems and to heal the sick, you know, resolve political disputes, all those kinds of things. And so <clears throat> I definitely think that's applicable uh, to today. I hesitate to call it modern shaman shamanism just because the word modern has its own um, pat baggage, but that definitely is what it is, that our collective illness, whether or not we <laughs> are ready to admit it, um, is, is, is calling on art to do something and i don't the thing about shamanism too is that it's 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 an antidote in some ways to ego you know um and i mean that in the the, the kind of the deep fundamental ego sense not just the confident sense that that our our identity structures are egoic and so um it's calling on artists to play a role in that as opposed to just contribute to it, which unfortunately many artists have been forced to do to, to contribute to the injury by creating, by being the handmaidens to the, to the marketing people and the, and the whole industrial sort of consumption business. So, um, Yes, all I can say really is that I do think it is a, is, is, is a shamanistic role for artists um, that's going to require new language that, that transcends all the old categories in some ways. And, and some, artists, some artists understand this. Some artists get it, but those that don't get it just get offended, <laughs> usually, because I'm saying, wait a minute, you got a lot of idiosyncratic ego in there. This isn't about your genius. It's about your genius. But where does your genius come from? It comes from the world. And that's what the story of the universe is saying at every turn. You are, a, you, you, <laughs> your gift is not yours alone. It comes from nature. And so, yeah, that's the shamanic message, I think. Yes, I completely agree with what you just said. Um, that's I had a I had a different um, eco interpretation of ecological intelligence from your presentation. I thought what he meant was actually this God, this nature intelligence. From my first glance at this this phrase, and I thought that this is the intelligence that we manifest in what you said about uh, um, where our intelligence or creativity comes from. Is well, I think the confusion of those two things is the, is the ticket. Like, that's the key, is to confuse those two intelligences and realize, actually, they're the same. That's what ontological continuity actually means. It means it's all the same thing. And that's what every, every ounce of science has been revealing along the way. It's just that the practice of science, the method of science, seeks to seeks to disconnect the observer from the observed. And so there's this kind of accidental separation that's been in, that's, that, that, we've in, that we have inherited. Uh, and so I think that the artists can work to heal that rift, obviously. If I may add something to that um, uh, as well. In the first place, I'll spell uh, referring to the question of Stella. Before we go to this, the question of Liz uh, and Rachel, um, the, we are not looking for something that 
what you can call eco arts. Uh, we are looking for artists in general, for people that are creative in general, uh, because um, to reduce art to, to an ecological form uh, would be limiting um, a creative practice. Uh, we are looking for creative practices, practices that immerse in nature and that um, like, uh, we don't see an, an opposite between culture and nature, between technology and, um, um, and, uh, and nature. Uh, but um, we just want to appeal to, uh, to artists to, to do what they already do without another perspective not a vision that we would like to share with them uh, in a dialogue uh, and uh, this can be any form of art and, um, it, can, it, it is meant that you do your thing and uh, not that there are any directions that are that are giving but that you create a path um, out of the um, exploration of the topics and themes that we that we offer you so it's um, not only meant for people that have already an ecological practice or have, an, have a background in, in so-called uh, ecological um, rooted art, uh, but for everybody that has a creative practice uh, to dive into this uh, world with us together. And uh, um, Rich, uh, I see some other questions, more about the course uh, um, in mm -hmm. the chat box. Uh, would you like to uh, react on that? Uh, sure. Um, so the course, the way, the way we're setting up now is the, the, the first step is to participate in a call like this, where we talk about what OICA is and, you know, you can get a kind of get an overview sense of what, what it will be like. Um, the next step is to participate in what we're calling a talk shop. So that will be a four week course where we do at least one call per week as a group through a small group. So they, they're, like between five and 10, you know, I think five is minimal, six or seven is optimal, 10 is maximum, through a, a free platform that you don't have to register for or anything like that. So we just hold these conversations online and we work our way through. I'm gonna try and share this, I hope it works. I'm gonna just try and share this, the course actual um, thing that, so I'm hoping you can see a bunch of stuff. Um, this is the Trello board that we use to work our way through the course. So you can see it goes through the four modules, person, place, practice, prosper. So each one of these things is a little card. Again, this is a free app that you can you sign up for. Uh, and there's each card has its own little video that describes the content. So I'll just see if this will play, but you know, these are one, these were ones I made for kids a while ago. So it's kind of fun. Um, so basically, we, there's a lot of content here. And the course is about working our way through this content in a structured way. So we'll go from person to place to practice to prosper. We'll talk about what all those things mean. There's all kinds of little practices you can do little audio practices. Um, and then we'll also get into these concepts of we're calling them co concepts of cosmosis, which is how the nature, how you get into nature and nature gets into you. The first three here are the core concepts, narrative, emergence, and fractals. Those are sort of, those three concepts, when they work together, they're really powerful. And then they're synergistically powerful in a whole new way. And we'll get into what that means. But, <clears throat> so those are the three that you're sort of expected to get familiar with over the course of the month. There's a whole bunch of others. Cybernetics, timeless play, phenomenology, radical affection, reciprocity, gratitude, goes on and on. These are all electives at this point. So if any of these sort of appeal to you, and they're all really cool, you can dive into those at your own sort of pace and your own leisure. But the point is those, you've got all these really cool concepts. And as you engage with them, they may or may not become part of your practice and part of your creative work. The story of nature is just that over the course of the four weeks, we also talk about all the different sort of chapters of human evolution in the universe. Again, in a way that, that validates continuity. And then there's the course tools. So we have, you know, I have Twitter, we have groups where we can put stuff online, whereby is the platform we use to communicate with each other. There's apps, 
one of my colleagues, uh, Fred, has created some amazing um, mobile tools that you can use to go out, capture your experiences in nature. The primary, um, the primary, the, the sort of the currency of, of, of Oika is earth stories, where you will go out, engage with nature, let it speak. You get visited by a moth or a, you hear a bird sing or you see the way the light shines. You capture it, whether it's on the phone, you make a sketch, you write a poem, you do an essay, you make a tweet, you do a Facebook post, whatever it is, you communicate that experience. And that's called an earth story. So you're kind of expected to do some earth stories. So this is what the course kind of looks like online. We work our way through this. Once we're done with that, so I'll stop sharing now. Um, that takes us a month, four weeks, conference calls. It's free. Um, we, we start to develop, we get to know each other. Then we can move on to the next level, which are, so we go from intro call like this, talk shop, which is the month long. Beyond that, what I wanna, what I'd like to do is to um, have a, what we're calling workshops, which are three, six, eight month programs that include some kind of exhibition at the end. Whether or not it's a group exhibition or some kind of themed solo exhibition, we work that out during, during the course. It's curated in this case by Geert. So we, you, we, artists work closely with the curator to come up with themes and things they wanna communicate and express. And the idea is this, that, so for example, we're at the, we're at the tree festival. A year from now, maybe they'll do the tree festival again, and we will pitch the exhibition to the festival to say, look, on the periphery of the festival, let's, we'll have these five, six, seven artists, whatever it is, creating themed work that, that manifest ecological intelligence. They're sort of Oika themed, but they're your own work. I'll promote it in any way I can, if, meaning give a talk at the conference that's, that, that champions all the different artists and how they come together. But the idea there too is that we've come up, we've figured out a way to make your work sellable in some ways so that we can generate some income. But above and beyond that income that we might get from selling your work, I have a grant that I can distribute to artists that we're working with. It's not a lot. It's, it's kind of just like a seed grant and support up to $400 for the, you know, for, for doing the artwork. If that artwork in some demonstrable way contributes to ecological restoration, whether it's, saving trees or planting something or for example I'm working on restoring old cranberry bogs back to their original wetland habitat so artists who work on that kind of stuff are eligible for another an additional $250 so it's not a lot of money but it's it's symbolic of you know our commitment but above and beyond that the idea is that we'll be much better at communicating the value of your work and making it more sellable. If that's something that if that's something that's important to you, we'll go out of our way to make that work for you. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm anticipating that that's that the workshop plus exhibition phase will last between three and eight months. So for example, if anybody knows anybody at like the the Y the Hay Festival up in Hay on Y, I'd love to do something with them. So get together a small group of artists. We do something on the periphery of that. It's a festival of ideas, but there's all kinds of festivals. Could be an art festival, culture, music, food, neighborhood, whatever. If you know, so if, if, if you have ideas on, on festivals that we could bring this project, by all means, let's explore it. But those are the kinds of things that will work out over the, over the longer three month to six month time frame. I was just, in that time. I, I, sorry, I was just going to say, I don't personally, but my colleagues do have connections with Hay. So I work at the British Library and we have the Hay Festival archive.
archive mm -hmm. in our archives at the British Library, including the audio. They transfer all the audio recordings to mm -hmm. us. Um, so, so I could talk to my contacts who do collaborate with Hay. Also, there was a project called Ambient Literature, which which was all about place and literature, and mm -hmm. they've had they've done sessions at Hay, interactive experimental sessions. So I could separately from my colleagues who who directly work with Hay, I could talk I could talk to to Tom Abba, who like I say, his his programmed some quite wacky stuff at previous Hay festivals. So I could mm -hmm. tap Tom up and and kind of maybe link you up if that would be useful. Beautiful. That kind of thing, plus others. I mean, there's, there's so many different kinds of festivals that, you know, we could, I'm just using that as an example, but of course. Um, yeah. Yes. A marvelous, Estella. That's a wonderful uh, offer. Uh, I, uh, we are a little bit limited in time, so um, yeah. are there any other questions about the course, about the procedure um, so the uh, that, the that you may have? Um, 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 Liz, I agree with you that the two concepts of ecology and economy are fundamentally at odds currently, but that's the kind of thing we're trying to address. It's the power of tribal heart and dreams. <laughs> They're very powerful. Uh, are you coming with university programs? No, we're not affiliated with any universities at this, at this time. Um, I tend to just, I don't need to do that. So why do it? Why, you know, why, why put it into a, f why make it, I don't know, just seems to limit the radicalness of it if we do that. Uh, I like the idea of working on relation, me too. So next step, if we want to participate, I guess reach out to either my, me or uh, Geert. Um, I can be reached through oika.com. Geert, maybe you already have their emails, I'm not sure, but- um, Yes, uh, I did send an email to let people yeah. uh, get in. I would say respond to either of us. Um, again, I, uh, I, I, I'm not an artist really. So um, hmm. if, if, it's, if it's a question about visual technique, I'm, <laughs> I think it's probably more equipped to handle those questions. Yes, now to return to the question of Stella about if you are collaborating with universities or uh, interdisciplinary, more uh, research oh. and academic institutes. Actually, we, like, like Rick said, we try to avoid this. Um, uh, this is a community. Uh, we want to not only to, to, to learn on, an, on a more intellectual, critical way, but as well to open our horizon by dialogue, by immersion, um, in an outdoors world, uh, not in an indoors uh, setting. As well, uh, the course is, is, has some quite intense conceptual uh, background. Uh, so the course is really delving into scientific, um, um, the concept and ideas, uh, always related with our experiences. Uh, but at the same time, it is intersecting with, with a parallel creative practice. So you are invited you are throughout the course to, to deepen your uh, creative practices, um, um, listening and opening yourself to these uh, scientific uh, approaches. Uh, but this never stops. It's not only, it doesn't uh, uh, focus on theory uh, alone, even if it's called course, it, it's, it's as well practice at the same time. And this is then inverted um, uh, during the, the three to six uh, month long process afterwards, where uh, the focus is more on practice, but at the same time, um, they're delving more into the, to the concepts, but out of an experiential um, and immersive uh, uh, feeling. The idea would be, if possible, to meet each other, to walk with each other, to be in nature with each other, um, as an uh, active and creative form of being together. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would second that. Yeah. I also think there is really a place element as well. So we'd have to take into consideration geography of people. Um, but I think once we know who's on, you know, who's interested, we can start to sort out how we can put together a cohort that works. Yes. Uh, now, Sophia asked, what is the next step if you want to participate to the course? <laughs> uh, that's uh, actually contacting us and uh, with your um, detail, your location, a bit of your background, and uh, then uh, we will go to the next step uh, together yeah. with you.
I've got other courses that are going on in the U.S. right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so in terms of starting a new one, I'm thinking, you know, next month would be okay. Like if we, let's give us a week or two to get organized and we could start one in June. Um, maybe two, if there's, if there's, if that's what the geography and the numbers and the schedule dictates, but maybe two. Um, the name of the app, I'm assuming you mean the, the, the one I showed you, it's called Trello. Mm -hmm. um, it's free. Trello is usually used differently. Most people use it as sort of like organizing, getting work done kind of thing. I'm using it much more as a content delivery pre platform. So I'm sort of pirated it in that way, uh, but it's beautiful and it works really well. The app works really well and the website works really well. Trello.com. If you, if, if you sign up for a course, I'll invite you to a, a board specific to our course. It'll look just like that one, but it will be just ours. Our group will be the only ones that are invited to, you know, to, to into it. I'm quite interested in your use of Trello like that. This is a separate conversation, but I see Trello normally as like a project management tool and yeah. your board looked beautiful actually. So, mm -hmm. so from a kind of wearing a different hat, how you're using Trello for this purpose, I'm quite, I'm quite interested. That's ecological intelligence working. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know? And it's free. So it's like, well, for you guys, it's free. So, um, and it's great too, because you can just watch a specific card or you can watch the whole board. So if I send a message to you, you'll get it, you know, on your card and it will tell you that you got it. Or you can just watch the whole board and it will update you with any changes. I should also mention right now, I'm working with a, a, a group of media artists and we're creating 10 minute videos for each one of the concepts. So if you were to go there right now, you'd see a little short one and a bunch of writing. I'm converting all of that into 10 minute videos. So each concept will get a 10 minute video that explains what it is. The idea there is that that gives you the basic knowledge and then we talk about it in our online time. So we, can, we reserve all of our sort of virtual conversations to talking about the content that you can watch on demand whenever you want through those videos. Also, um, I think very soon we're gonna be launching a kind of a podcast format. So practice, which is the second module, is all about how do we experience this stuff. And so we're creating audio versions of practices. For example, radical affection is one that we really use where you go out, you find a place, you project a certain feeling out into the world and see what gets reflected back. That's, that's a practice called radical affection. And so we're producing, we'll, over the course of the next couple of months, we'll be producing those kinds of practices as well. Okay. Um. Sorry, I've been talking a lot. I feel like I'm yelling. Uh, I just get excited. And um, uh, so I just, sorry if I'm like in your face. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was, I was going to say Fiona had messaged me and I don't know whether she's messaged you Rich and Git. Yeah. Fiona I didn't know whether you wanted to ask that question because I, I can't answer it but not to put you on the spot but I did want to me to mention. I watched Fiona make ink from uh, oak galls. Wow, wow oak galls. that sounds amazing. It's very, very cool. Those, 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 those ant galls are really cool too. There's a whole story about those. I used to when I was a kid, I used to climb trees a lot and I would find those oak galls up in the trees when they were still green. Mm -hmm. And being a kid, I thought, you know, I, I opened one up and I could see that it had this internal structure. It looked like this star radiating out. And I was like, there must be something special in there. So I picked it apart and I found the little grub inside and I was like, what's that? So I ate it. You <laughs> and, ate uh, it. <laughs> I did. I thought, I thought you will only find these things at the tops of trees. So if you eat these, you'll be a really good tree climber. That was just like the logic of the little kid. But uh, I don't know. Now whenever I see one, I think of that. So to see you making ink out of it was really cool. Mm -hmm. I've killed too many little wasp larvae. Sorry about that. I didn't know <laughs> what I was doing. <laughs> I, I don't do it anymore. So. Mm -hmm. and you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Yes. 
Uh, it is too late for new participant. Uh, no. If somebody wants to uh, to join the group. No, that's what this call is about. It's about finding people who are interested in starting a group. Okay, so, so even if they haven't seen uh, the video, the, the, the meeting today, oh, you, you can join it. after. Okay. I don't know it's being recorded. recorded. Where it goes from here, I don't know. Okay. So, so I will send you the recording and we can talk about it, uh, Sophie. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. If you check out our YouTube channel, by the way, there's a lot of content on there. You can, you know, just sort of sift through to get a sense for, the, you know, the personalities involved and um, what Earth stories are like. I just want to mention that there is a pretty cool program at the Serpentine Gallery in, the, in London, which is called General Ecology. It's bringing art and science together, artists and scientists. Wondering if you um, have already known about this. If not, I, they also have a podcast. I think it's a very nice um, resource or inspiration. Yeah. I, I'm really hoping to do more podcasts. Like I've, I've done a couple and they were just really, it was, it's so great to have somebody asking questions who follows along and, you, you know, really so good podcasters, I'm always looking for opportunities to talk to more podcasters. So if anybody knows any, you know, and and want to and want to build this thing with us, feel free to do that. Um, but Gear, I don't know if you know that gallery, maybe. I, I know about it. Yes, it's a very interesting yeah. program. Yeah. I'm going to share the link with everyone. Okay, thanks. I could actually share the link to this Trello board that I have here. So why don't I do that? This is kind of a generic one, but you'll be able to get on it. You should be able to get on it without any, without any downloads or registrations or anything like that. Let's see. So this is going to go to everybody, right? Everyone. I'll just type it in here. So you should be able to get to that Trello board. Again, if you look at the videos, those were mostly for kids. So uh, they're kind of fun and goofy. I'm not always that fun and goofy. Thank you, Charlotte. Yeah, and, thanks, Charlotte. Uh, uh, I will uh, send uh, regarding the YouTube um, the video of this uh, conversation. Um, I will send the link to all together with the other links that were mentioned in the in the conversation um, and Great. looking forward to your replies and to your uh, comments and feedbacks um, yeah it'd be great should be fun mm -hmm. and educational mm -hmm. andrew are you still there still here i am i pull it to a close yeah Yes, indeed. So the question was if this video, uh, when or how long this video will be um, available on the on YouTube? Will it be, be stay permanently? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, as long as we can afford to keep it, uh, that might be a hint that uh, we're uh, we're a volunteer festival and we're looking for donations. So <laughs> that that might be very good timing to say that. Um, I've just actually had an email from our student volunteers who are putting our videos up on YouTube, saying they're feeling a little overwhelmed at the moment uh, by the sheer number of videos they're having to put up. So uh, I think it may take a few days for this one to be up on the YouTube channel, uh, but our intention is to uh, keep it there for at least a year because what we're hoping is that uh, we can use it as a, a you know legacy to try to win over uh, funders or sponsorship for uh, future urban tree festivals. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so should we uh, should we call it a day? So uh, uh, if we unmute you all, you can give Rich and Gert a round of applause. <laughs> just just showing up was applause enough. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, looking forward to your feedback comment uh, by email, and it was uh, delightful to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Okay.
Ap I said, apologies to everyone that we've had trouble at the beginning uh, getting you on the call, uh, the uh, technical problems we encountered and things. Uh, there are other things going, other events going on in the Urban Tree Festival, even tonight. Um, I'm meant to be hosting a call which has just started, so whoops, I'm not doing that at the moment. Um, and uh, there are plenty of things happening tomorrow as well, so do uh, drop in, just go to urbantreefestival.org and uh, we'll welcome you all there. Many thanks, I'll, I'll end the meeting now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.